Hello and welcome back to our Countdown to Christmas edition of A Splash of Paint, where it's time to rejoin versatile artist David Hyde as he demonstrates how watercolours can capture the beauty of a lovely lavender landscape in the concluding part of today's Try Your Hand Out project. Welcome back. Um, I'm going to finish this uh, little painting. It's dry by now, so uh, we can start to put some of the darks. Now, the main dark that surrounds this is the trees. I'm going to stick with this uh, Cosmotop um, squirrel brush, and I'm going to mix some dark green. I'm just going to use some Viridian. Now, it's important when you get the darks is that you have plenty of paint. Um, if you can see that stickiness there, it's no longer a wash. Now, that stickiness means there's a lot of gum arabic in that mix, but it also means there's a lot of pigment. So a watery mix might well look the same, but if it's watery, then it's not going to be dark. So I want this dark, and I want to remove as much of the green as possible. Otherwise, the trees will not look uh, real. I might even put a little bit of ultramarine in there um, just to darken them and take a little of the green off. I might need to remix a little of this. Uh, but you can see the consistency of it. That's probably a tad thick, but that should be okay. And with this uh, uh, large soft brush loaded up, I you tend to use the side of the brush and put my trees on to start them like that. So you get a, a foliage effect that you want at the top of the tree. As you come down the tree, um, you can close it up and make the, the tree more dense. It should contrast nicely with the sky. On the other hand, oops. On the other hand, when you get down to the roof, it'll make a, a massive contrast there with the top of the roof. And the roof all of a sudden will become visible. And when I get down to that edge there, it starts to give the building a little bit of, uh, a little bit of presence, okay? So another tree here, another top. Try and do this loosely. Um, and loosely means randomly, and that little side movement with the brush puts a randomness um, onto the brush mark, which suggests uh, uh, open trees and, um, you know, masses of leaves, which is uh, what we want. I'm running out a little bit of paint there, so I'm going to leave that one and, and put a lighter one here. Now, if you can see the effect this dark will have on this side of the building now, as I come down here, there's a straight, oops, I mustn't put my hand in the wet paint. There's a straight line there, so you then need some control and hold the brush normally close to the ferrule to get that nice bit of control. Okay, I've got a bit, see? So that starts to stand out. Tonal contrast gives you the effect or the illusion of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface, which is what this is. Uh, I'm not going to leave too much white down here. Now I'm going to go across and do, I'm not going to put tree all the way around it, but I'm going to put the next tree there to define that edge. I'll just put these in along the top of that roof and you'll see the effect again on that roof I'll put some blue in there. It's, base, it's practically not green at all. Right? This, uh, that's, I quite like that. In fact, I need a bit more in there. Bring that across. See, it's almost like a dry brush with this sticky paint. And on the surface of the paper, it just wipes off some random leaves and, and breaks. Uh, and of course, the sky is showing through that, so that's fine. Take that down, fill it in as you get to the roof. Okay, and take that across. Okay, this is going to be in front of that. So um, I'm to make that look in front of it. It's the same. It could be the same tree and everything, but I'm going to use some light on here. I didn't clean my brush then. You don't always have to clean your brush. Um, but there's enough of a different colour on there. Make it a little lighter. To put a bit of light in there. Okay, and I'm going to use some of that brighter colour here 
to give a little variation on these trees that are closer so that they, they look different to the ones that are behind. And that's all you have to do, really, to, to separate them. And then once I get that done, back to the dark. And I'm going to bring that down. Remember that contrast we were allowed for right at the beginning, that nice bit of light through there. I'm going to put some foliage growing over that little end there, just to soften it. Now, on this painting, there is an arch going through here. Uh, you can see where the arch is. It's actually, you can see the trees behind. So in order to see that, I'm simply going to, you can allow for a couple of people there. I just put them, put them in, or you can uh, just have the arch itself. Makes a nice little focal point of interest. I'll come back to that in a moment. And we've got... Uh, a little bit of a tree here in the foreground. And they were all one tone, so this time these foreground ones are going to be two tones, and they'll, you'll see them as being closer to you. So I'm just going to bring that down over that window so I don't have to paint so many window panes. There we are. And bring, again, bring that down to that nice little bright patch. OK, and I'll do the same quickly with this one. Oh, I've done the dark bit on that, haven't I? Uh, the light bit on that, so I've just put a little dark around the base of that. You do use with dark paints, and it is important to be able to mix and use the darker tones with watercolour. Um, it brings your pictures to life, and it gives them a lot of impact. But you will use a lot more paint. Okay, so I would advise for this type of uh, good contrast watercolour painting, is you buy tubes because you can, you've got easy access to soft paint in quantity, which is very useful. The um, colour in my pan are actually squeezed from the tubes you see around me, so they are tube colours. Okay, so that's that, that's a nice contrast. You could add a little bit more, I'm going to change to a detail brush. One nice uh, thing you can do with buildings is to just darken the base. I always do that with uh, buildings. It makes them stand firmer into the ground. Okay, and um, also it increases that contrast with the grasses. Okay, buildings always weather from the ground up. You know, rain splashes, dirt spreads up the walls, and it'll give the building a little bit more texture and feeling. Rather than that, it looks better just to wait the bottom with tone. Again, you don't have to look to see whether your building's weathered. Your buildings will always look better with a little bit of weathering, and it also increases that contrast. Now, to make this building three-dimensional, all you have to do is to think exactly about what you're painting. You don't need to look at your um, subject to do this. Just think about it. This is a building, OK? Now, this stands forward from that, so that must have a shadow on it. Okay, and that's it. Now, it also needs a shadow here, but I don't want such a strong shadow because this is lighter and I need to see that against the background. So I'll just bring that down like that. And you find with this mix, this is just, just some burnt amber and a little ultramarine blue, you find every shadow, there'll be a shadow underneath the gutter, uh, there'll be a shadow under the windowsill, so there'll be a shadow across here. I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, there'll be, uh, oh, that's wet. <laughs> there'll be a shadow up there, if I can get that without, that's a bit wobbly, but there's a shadow there and a shadow there. And I hope you can see how just applying these shadows just makes this uh, three-dimensional. Okay, so... Uh, the little bit of brick detail there and across there, all you need to see it is a little shadow. So, also, this bush is going to cast a shadow on the brick. Now, I'm not putting this shadow on the window, uh, and I'm going to put that under there and cast that shadow as well. And this roof is hipped, so I'm just going to put a slightly, well, a much lighter shade on there, 
because if you don't change the tone, your eye doesn't register it as a change of angle. You can put the detail on the roof things, you know, tiles later. We've got a little bit of uh, blue, and put a touch of magenta in this just to grey it slightly. That's too much magenta. Uh, but the important thing is with this is not the colour, it's the tone. You must paint it so you can see this roof light against that background. The painting, once you start to paint it, the painting will dictate what tones and things you use. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take just a little bit out of that. That needs to dry, obviously. And while that's drying, I'm just going to use some blue for the shadows in the windows. Now, the windows, I'll do that one in a moment, they will also cast a shadow because they're normally set back into the wall. So you need to put a shadow across each window. Don't paint it all the way around. Okay, um, because the light's going to hit that side. So it's like a, a seven in this case, because of the direction of the light here. Uh, this has got the bush, a shadow from the bush. So if you think about where each of the items in your painting is relative to everything else, you can calculate where your shadows are going. Because on your photograph, if you're working from photographs or an overcast day, you might not see... Um, you might not see any particular shadows, but in order to make this two-dimensional painting look three-dimensional, you need to be quite positive with your shadows. Right, while that's drying, I'm going to just work on this, uh, magenta, uh, on this field. I'm going to use as a basic uh, colour for this some magenta for my lavender, and I'm going to start just to put light, a light wash in here, it's going to be loose uh, because you're not going to paint lavender. Uh, there's a, a saying in painting that if you can't count them, don't paint them. In other words, you need to suggest it rather than actually sit and paint lots of different uh, lavender flowers, which is impossible. So that's a basic lavender colour. You'll notice as well, I've altered, they didn't actually grow like this. They grew across the face of the building, but I think it looks stronger it, when you have rows of things like plowed fields or flower beds. If you can alter them so that they point directly to the focal point, your composition is, is improved. That's a little wee bit strong there. I'm just going to take a little bit of that out further down. Okay. Oh, done it again. Okay. Actually, a bigger brush would speed this up a little bit. This is, um, I've switched to these sable brushes now. We've got more control and they come to nice points and hold a lot of water. So I can just get those on. Now, this still doesn't look three-dimensional. Now, in order to make your foregrounds look three-dimensional, you must divide it into two. A distance, a mid-distance, and a foreground. And you need to paint them slightly differently. You need to increase the contrast and strength of colour as you come forward. So I'm going to use a little of that dark green. I've just put a little bit of viridian in it just to pep it up again. And I'm going to start to put some darker green in around here, but I'm not taking it too far back. Okay. Okay, so that will... That would bring the, fore the foreground towards you and make it look flat. Not flat, as in a bad sense, but flat as in a natural, natural sort of uh, state. So. Okay, that, so that stronger contrast there will bring this forward, and there'll be some greenery in amongst the lavender. And, you know, how much time you want to spend on this is up to you, but do try and get, reduce some of that light so your eye is drawn to that area of light there. Just put 
Oops. Again, it doesn't matter so much about this one because you want your eye, I want my eye focused a little bit in there. And then to finish the lavender, you just go back with some, I, I use uh, ultramarine blue, nice and strong, because that needs to just add a little bit of contrast in this foreground area. So again, don't take it too far back, and that contrast will just bring this foreground forward. So you don't have to paint in any great detail, but do remember contrast and colour as it comes forward increases to give you a three-dimensional look. All I have to do really with this is to just paint the windows and it's finished. There's a few of them, but I'll just quickly dab a Uh, some dark in there with a small brush and uh, ultramarine blue and burnt umber is good for this or burnt sienna. They both make a good dark and um, then it gives the, the windows um, the final little, little look. One there, one there. Now you need to take a little bit more time than I'm taking here. I wish I'd done I wish I'd have had these replaced with double glazing now, actually. It would have made them easier to paint. Okay, but see, it gives it a three-dimensional look. Okay, and finally, can't resist it. I'm just going to put a little drain pipe up the top. They say if you're... Halfway through the painting, or three quarters of the way through the painting, if you're still looking at the subject, you're doing something wrong. So it's a good thing to bear in mind, you know. Some, sometime the painting itself has got to take over. And I need one more little shadow slope of that roof. No, actually, it could be straight like that. But I've got to pick that shadow up from the roof. Now, there should be a shadow across the top there. But if you put the shadow across the top there, you're not going to see it against the background. So a little artistic license. Just think about everything as you paint it. And when you stand back, you need to see everything uh, working in three dimensions. OK. I must be nearly out of time. I'm just going to put a door in there, a lavender door. There we go. That's just about it. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, it's a way of creating a three-dimensional look uh, with buildings and with landscape just by using tone. Thanks, David. Great use of tones and contrasts. A really inspirational painting that really lends itself to gorgeous colours of a lavender in bloom. Right, time for our final break now, folks. But join us in part four when SAA professional artist Warren Seeley and popular pencil wizard Malcolm Cudmore add their own Christmas offerings to our seasonal celebrations. And I'll be answering a few more of your artistic questions you've been sending into the Splash of Paint studio. See you very soon. <laughs>